Hello, my name is Heidi Seibold and I work at Helmholtz AI at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. Today I want to talk about computational reproducibility. Now, what is this whole thing about reproducibility all about? Um, let's start with the problems we're facing. So the problems we're facing is what we call the reproducibility crisis. And this is something where researchers say, we think we're not able to reproduce a lot of the scientific research that others have done. And that, of course, is a problem. And we want to do better. Of course, we want to be really actually science champions rather than people producing science that's not reproducible. So today I want to talk about like how you can get started in making your work more reproducible. But first I want to tell you what are the reasons for you as a selfish person to work reproducibility, uh, to work reproducible um, beyond just like, yeah, doing good science and science that you can be proud of. Um, first of all, working reproducible, re oh God, working reproducibly um, avoids disasters. So think of you do research, it's not reproducible. And in the end, there's a lot of problems um, because of that. Um, when you work reproducibly, this also leads to um, your workflow being improved and that makes you better at writing papers or more fluent at doing so. Um, you can also convince reviewers because obviously I as a reviewer will uh, want to know how you did things and if you can provide me that information and if I believe that this is reproducible then I will give you a better review. Furthermore, of course, we want in science to build on the shoulders of giants or at least to build on the shoulders of our colleagues. And this is only possible or only reasonable if the work that other, others have done is something that I want to build upon. And of course, you can build your reputation. I personally think that, um, yeah, people I want to hire are those who make their work open and reproducible. Now, what do I actually mean when I say reproducible? Um, because there's a lot of different um, definitions out there about this term. And I'm taking here the definition of the Turing Way, which is a really cool online book that I can definitely recommend. And there um, we define reproducible if with the same data and doing the same analysis, we get the same results. And um, that is different to these other terms like replicable, robust or generalizable. And it's actually probably the easiest part. So it should be the yeah, minimum standard that we have in science. Now, I wanna talk about the practical steps towards computational reproducibility. So I'm focusing here on the computational part because that's where my expertise lies. And I think that's also the things that should be most easily, uh, easily accomplishable. So what are first steps that you couldn't take? Um, first of all, I recommend getting organized. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk in a second about the details, but getting organized is like something that everyone can do and it's really, really helpful. Then um, use open source software. That's really a good um, thing to start with. Use version control. That's something that has a bit of a higher barrier, but it has changed my life completely. And then um, also make your work available online because if it's not available, then it may be reproducible, but no one can actually check. So uh, let's start with the first step, um, getting organized. Um, when I think about this, when I like prepare a talk about yeah how to get organized, I always think uh, of the quote of Albert Einstein who says, orders for idiots, genius can handle chaos. But then I think, well, let's not pretend I'm not a genius and most of you probably aren't either. So let's 
get good at organizing our stuff. Good organization actually starts pretty simple. It starts with not sending emails with files and instead have a smart sharing systems of files, having a nice file organization and having good names for things, including files, but also in code, like the different um, objects that you create and so on. So um, if we think about emails with files, this is a an example I would always like to give is an email where someone sent me and 10 others this email with like the first public version of the protocol have a look and do comment we can also meet to combine our reviews and like when I read this it, it just feels like way too complicated it could be so much easier if you'd have like a smart system where everyone could online write in the same file have like information on who did what and so on. And with this, this person is gonna get 10 different versions of the um, document back and has to combine all the thoughts of everyone. And it's like very, uh, a huge hassle where we have um, good technical solutions for already, I think. Um, when I think of a nice file organization, I always try to have one folder for each project. And then I have folders in each project that are called something like journal correspondence for the things where I have to talk to the um, reviewers in the journal, then one folder for analyses that contains my yeah code for the data analysis, the data itself, and maybe some functions that I wrote for, for the analysis. And the main folder contains then the paper and the text for the paper. When we're talking about fi file naming or naming in general. It's There's a couple of things that um, we should take into account and that are actually pretty easy. And once we do that, once we started doing that, I think um, life gets a lot more easy. So for example, don't have file names that don't mean anything. My abstract, for example, can be a lot of different things and I have no idea what it is about. Um, if there's like weird uh, punctuation spaces somewhere in the middle of the file name that's usually not very computer friendly so my computer sometimes doesn't know how to handle these um, especially yeah when we think of also things like Chinese characters or something if you have those in your file names then if you send it to another computer it the chances are pretty high like, that this other computer will not be able to handle it. So I use just um, things without spaces, no weird characters and so on. Instead, um, use file names that are explain what the yeah file contains. I often also use, I start with the the date actually for example i have a folder with all my presentations and this um the file name always starts with the year that i gave the talk in and then the month and then the what the talk was about and then where i gave the talk um so things like these and in between i use um yeah dashes or whatever um to avoid using spaces yeah, so this helps my computer understand what it means. Um, I can understand what it means and it automatically gets a nice ordering, which I think is nice as well. So next um, step in uh, making your work reproducible is using open source software. Um, <laughs> here I just brought you uh, two images that I think represent very nicely what I want to say. Um, this one here on the left says, I see you use, you use Excel instead of R to do statistics. I too like to live dangerously. Um, I think there's so many problems with Excel and other closed source programs that make you do work that's not very good. and also most importantly it's closed source software so others cannot even maybe run the same analysis that you did and so it's in a way not reproducible by design um because well you just can't do the same analysis 
with the same data because you don't really know how to run the analysis. Um, so I use open source software um, like R, or you can also use Python. And um, that's really, really powerful and really good and um, makes your life a lot better in the long run, although it's harder to learn on short term. The picture on the right um, shows uh, what kids are scared about in at Halloween or in like in general. And I really like this edited picture that where the third kid says, uh, what scares you the most? University units that require the use of statistical software other than R. So that's something that I, I think is really funny. If you want more of that, I posted the link where I got these images. Um, okay, next step, use version control. And this is probably the, my hardest recommendation um, for you because it does have some sort of a learning curve to be able to use version control, but it's not impossible and you're all smart people, right? Um, so what is version control? So version control in the olden days is like, you have a paper and you call it paper draft because it's a draft. And then you go to your supervisor and you discuss and then you update it, then you call the paper update. And then you work on it a little bit more and think, okay, now it's done. And then you call it paper final. And then it starts to get frustrating because of course there's lots of more updates to do. And then eventually you get very, very frustrated. Um, this is an example that I showed before. This is also sort of like version control because you see here the file name has something like version one and the date where um, it was created. So this is also sort of like a version control, but then this is very, yeah, we would just have better solutions for that. And uh, let me show you one example of what this can look like. So um, this is real version control and it also nicely includes uh, the possibility to back up your files. So this is something that I use very, very much, even if I work alone, is I use version control to back up my files. Um, so that it doesn't only live on my computer, but also lives elsewhere where my house can burn down and my research is still available. So here you see uh, an example, so a screenshot of a GitLab page. So GitLab is one website um, that works with Git, um, where Git is the version control system. And here you see a file, it's a text file where yeah, I don't know, I wrote some text and you see in the red part, you see the text that I deleted and the green part is the text that I added. And then you see a little highlight, maybe you can see that in the in the red part where the where it shows what changed um, between the red and the green part. And you see that I tend to put too many C's in words. <laughs> um, so this is very nice. You can see um, not only when this was changed, so you see that there at the top, but you can also see who changed it, which was me, and then also what was changed. And that's really cool to collaborate with other people, but also you can go back to older versions if you decide, okay, my new text is rubbish. I need to go back to something that I've already deleted because nothing is lost in version control. <laughs> so what are the prerequisites um, to version control? So as I said before, use text. So for documents and papers, use uh, LaTeX or Markdown because that's text-based. Word is not text-based and doesn't work um, with at least Git um, very well. Um, and then also for analyses, use scripts such as R and Python. And um, what other requirements prerequisite is there, well, you need to be able to learn something new, or at least, <laughs> yeah, you need to be willing to learn something new, which is Git, um, which I still highly recommend because it's going to save you so much time in the future that it's definitely worth um, learning. What is the next step for working reproducibly? As I said, I think um, that real reproducibly, re reproducibility, oh, this word, um, only works when you have your work openly available because only then others can really assess whether it's reproducible. 
and for that you need to make your work openly available so um, make your data available if possible um, there's this term fair data that I want to mention which is maybe a, a even more precise version um, which means the data is findable accessible interoperable and reusable and um, fair also works with data that you can publish online without any restrictions because it may be that there's privacy concerns if you work with human data for example so this is something um, you can dive into if you're interested in more search for fair data and that's um, will open you a lot of information that's very helpful um, then of course also you want to open uh, you want to have open code. So what are the steps towards open code? Using scripts again. Um, so no clicking because that can not be made available um, in a sensible manner. And then just publish the code online. And um, that's obviously easiest if you already use version control, then you can just make your Git repository openly available um, with, it's just like one setting in your repository and you're done. Um, in general, open material can, there's lots of different platforms that you can use. Um, general platforms that a lot of people are using are the Open Science Framework or Zenodo, which I can definitely recommend because they're backed by the scientific community. I don't recommend using um, platforms that are owned by commercial companies such as Fakeshare, so I don't wouldn't recommend that. Um, GitLab is for me or also probably GitHub are the exceptions for me um, because they're just like these version control systems that are super powerful and have been around for a long time. And I think they've been good for the community. Um, there's also the possibility that um, different institutions have GitLab. So for example, my home institution, the Hamlet Center Munich has its own GitLab instance uh, where I can host my code, which is really, really nice. And then if I want to publish it somewhere else, I can always do that later. But um, yeah, using the self-owned uh, GitLab instance of my institution is really, really nice. So these are the four steps that I would recommend as like first steps to make your work more reproducible, get organized, use open source software, use a version control and make your work available online. Now, if that seems overwhelming to you, um, you're probably not alone. So um, what I can say uh, is a reproducible research requires software skills, but I think there is a solution. I think that we need people who specialize in these things and reproducible research and open science. And I think that um, research software engineers are the key to that, which are people like who really know a lot about software and a lot about these technical tools and this is something that i imagine for the future of science um to be there people who like help with these um tasks um so if you want someone <laughs> around to help researchers um then yeah, help us help you by joining the movement of the research software engineers. So there's an association in Germany, um, which is called Gesellschaft für Forschungssoftware, but there is uh, associations in all, yeah, all kinds of other countries. And uh, the motto is better software, better research. Um, for further reading, I definitely re recommend taking a look at the Turing Way, which is a free open online book. Um, that has um, different topics, but one of the big and advanced topics is reproducibility in data science. And I think that's um, a great read and just take a look, it's free, it's online, uh, go for it. Um, before I finish, I would like to ask you for a small favor. I'm nominated to be AI Newcomer of the Year the votings are open and everyone can vote. So um, if you have a moment to spare, go to this website that I linked here and just enter your email address and vote for me. Finally, I want to finish uh, with um, 
yeah, some advertisement for a new podcast that I'm creating, which is Open Science Stories. I expect that the first episodes will come out end or mid-February um, this year. So looking forward to sharing some Open Science Stories uh, from different people with you. And um, with that, I say thank you for listening and see you next time.